A few months ago, Jeff and I were on a boat uh, counting ospreys, as I recall, and we talked about a lot about geology. And the thought occurred to us that we ought to see if we could make a way to uh, uh, combine the notion, the idea of geology plus birds. And of course, the interesting thing is that the uh, birds have adapted to various habitats, ecotones, we might call them, and they're all a function of geography and geology. And so we thought it would be a really interesting idea if, if Jeff would give us a presentation on how the Sierra Nevada, our area, was constructed, that geologically speaking, tectonically speaking, to provide those habitats for the, the various birds. So that's what Jeff's going to talk about tonight. Next month, we're going to have uh, Rich Semino, who will be following on from Jeff, and he'll be talking about the species, the bird species that have adapted to those particular uh, ecotones and how they might have done that. So many of you will know that Jeff was uh, a professor of geology at uh, Columbia uh, Junior College. So now I'd like to turn it over to Jeff. All yours, Jeff. Thank you. Now, uh, so we're halfway back uh, through from today, halfway back or halfway forward. Now we're going through what's called the Proterozoic. And as far as life on Earth during this time, single cell bacteria, the oldest fossils we have are right in here. One celled organisms, very simple. So now we got bacteria, bacteria, bacteria. Okay, we haven't even gotten to the good stuff, which is the, the uh, Phanerozoic. Phanero means coarse grained or coarse grained life, multicellular life. That's down here on this wrist, right? So now we're all the way down here on your left hand, okay? Getting towards today. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Right hand, yeah. I'll get on and come back here. All right. And um, here's what happens during this period of time. I zoomed in. You can sit down if you want and just hold your hand up. <laughs> All right, here's, here's your left hand going towards today, right here. Got it? Okay, so thanks for indulging with my activities. We're not done yet. So this um, portion is just that last little, sorry, that last little bit right here. That's your wrist, right? See it right there? It goes all the way down there. So now we're going to zoom in on that. Oops, all the way to the... Uh, Phanerozoic, the last 500 MA million years ago, mega M is millions of years ago, 500 million years, 251 million, 65. This is when dinosaurs died out. And then here we are today, right? So here's our wrist. This whole part of uh, time is called the Paleo Old Zoic, zoology, zoo, study of life, old life as we know it, multicellular life. And some multicellular organisms actually lived a little bit before this, right? Um, but for simplicity's sake, this is our Paleozoic. You know, Methozoic, age of dinosaurs, is from about your middle finger knuckle down to this joint right here. Think about that. That's the age of dinosaurs on Earth? This is it, folks. All this time went by before we got any dinosaurs, and we're, we're getting the birds buried, so... Hang in there, all right? So right in here, that's the age of dinosaurs. And then everybody knows asteroid came, zapped them, wiped them out. And then we're in what we call recent life, middle life, Mesozoic, now Ceno is recent life. And so this is the age of mammals, the age of flowers, flowering plants, uh, this is the age of birds, right? So where are birds on here? Let's see if I can go forward, right? Here's a bird-like thing, an Archaeopteryx. Maybe, many of you probably heard of this. This is a transition fossil found 150 million years ago in Germany. And it basically has dinosaur-like features and bird-like features. It's got wings, it's got some feathers, um, it's got a wishbone, and these are some of the structures that modern yeah. birds have. Not I'm a turn, not a in between. 151. Now remember on our timeline, 251, start of the Mesozoic, now the Cenozoic. So right here is 151 million years ago. Right about, if this is your middle finger, right at this <laughs> knuckle right, right here about, right? And so um, 
the uh, it had teeth. This thing had teeth as well, right? So if you wanted to, you know, you could show people the last two knuckles is the age is about when we have evidence for birds on Earth, right? And if you're really careful and you don't want to flip them the bird, like, oops, sorry. Just remember that's the bird, right? <laughs> Just flip someone the bird and that's the last 150 million years back to Archaeopteryx, that middle knuckle right there. All right, so let's review a little bit. Here's our, using our body as a geologic timeline. Now, hopefully you understand hell on earth. <laughs> single cell microorganisms, okay, and then right about here, um, halfway through, um, we start getting some eukaryotic cells, not just the simple prokaryotes, cells with, uh, uh, with uh, DNA and stuff like that, and then um, multicellular organisms with the birds at the very, very end. Now, where do people fit in? Bird watchers, right? Um, so, bird watchers, our species, we think the oldest fossils of Homo sapiens sapiens dates to about 300,000 years ago. So if you took a nail file and you passed it once and you shaved off one little layer of fingernail, you will have wiped out all of Homo sapiens sapiens. <laughs> one little shaving. That is how thin that little 300,000 years is. And so if you actually divide 300,000 uh, by 4.6 billion, that means bird watchers have been around for about 0.005% of the time, 99.995% of the time, we, we weren't around to watch birds. But that's sinking. But, but how do you feel about knowing that information? Significant? I made it. No predators got me. No diseases got my ancestors. Okay. Maybe insignificant, like really? That's a word. That's just so I feel insignificant. So you can have a range of feelings, and many people commonly do. Now, part two of our story is the geologic history of the Sierra Nevada and Central Mother. Um, so um, the best way, probably, to to start this is to a, a quick review of plate tectonics. There are three types of tectonic plate boundaries and two types of tectonic plates. Continental plates that are made of granitic rocks and sediments and metamorphic rocks, they're less dense. They just don't have as much iron as ocean crust. Ocean crust is thinner, but it's more dense. So when they meet up, ocean crust goes under continental crust because the, the surface of the earth is continuously moving around about as fast as our fingernails or toenails grow. <laughs> so uh, that's pretty slow. And yet, it's fast over geologic time. Plates can move across the surface of the Earth. So there are three different ways that they do move. We, we have what are called transform plate boundaries, divergent plate boundaries, and convergent. Divergent and convergent. Divergent spread apart, convergent converge, and, and crash into each other. Transform, what is that? Well, that's an, sort of an engineering uh, term for, for sliding past, transform motion. Instead of bouncing in, spreading out, um, they just slide past. San Andreas Fault is a perfect example in California of that, of a transform type of motion. That would be this right here. California also, if you go to Southern California, out to uh, the uh, Salton Sea, the plates are spreading apart. Baja is rifting away from the rest of Mexico, and it's attached to San Diego and LA and Monterey, and it's sliding past uh, it'll be LA is going to slide past San Francisco at some point, 10, 20 million years from now. The, the, uh, that chunk sliver of Baja will slide off into the ocean towards Alaska and crash in at some point. And you probably heard California's falling into the ocean, hinny penny, turkey lurkey. Well, about the time plate tectonics came to fruition, late 60s. Um, Malibu and Southern California is having landslides and you know all kinds of nastiness and houses were falling into the ocean. And um, someone said, the California's gonna fall, fall into the ocean, no, slide off into the ocean towards Alaska. It's falling into the ocean. And so they want to sell newspapers probably and that's where that myth likely came from. But sliding off into the ocean horizontally all the way to Alaska, yes. 
Let me have it. Tap, if it keeps doing what it's doing today. So here's a, a spreading center out in the ocean where one plate's going one way based on these arrows, one's going the other. This plate is going down under this uh, continental plate over here. This is called subduction. And this is the answer to part of the story here. I'm telling you in advance, subduction and accretion are the answer to the geology there under our feet right here. Here it is, the answer. Western margin of North America formed by subduction and accretion. This is subduction, one plate, a more dense ocean plate, typically going under a continental plate. Accretion is when something's on that ocean plate, like sediment, sand, and mud that gets deposited on there, gets scraped on as that plate, earthquake by earthquake, is trying to make it down under the continental plate. Accretion is like welding or sticking putty, you know, bondo on a dent in a car. You're accreting some new material sticking to that. And that's how California and the western margin of North America has been created and built out over geological time. And these are called uh, island arc volcanoes. That's going to come up again, too. Uh, uh, Alaska has the Aleutian island arc chain. Japan is an island arc complex of island volcanoes. Uh, same thing with the Philippines and with Indonesia. These are all island arc complexes that are moving slowly towards their nearby continents that will stick or accrete or weld onto the edge, edge of those continents. All right, so I uh, shamelessly stole this from Keith Meldahl, who wrote a book called Rough Hewn Land. He did a great job. He used to teach at Miracosa College Geology, and he published a couple books about geology. He also likes beer. So this middle diagram right here, he said in his book, I had to drink some beer. I usually don't drink canned beer. <laughs> I like better beer. <laughs> anyway, we got Budweiser, Coors, and Bud Light over here. And the Bud can is uh, stuck next to the wall. And the Coors can is one of these island arcs, an island in an arc complex coming and put -put putting on a tectonic plate. And it smashes into the Bud can and squishes it. Behind that is another island of our complex, put, put, putting come, coming in. And so the Coors can get, get squished until the Bud Light can get squished. And it's a conveyor line, subduction zone. And so that built this little structure and smashed these cans up. Our rocks, where we are in the middle, are all smashed up like these beer cans, right? He's got diagrams of, of this on the left with a subduction zone right here, going the other way than the previous diagram. Here's our continental plate. Here's an island, a volcanic island in this island arc complex coming towards the continent. Here it is right now. It's rifted, I'm uh, sorry, it's uh, rafted onto and stuck, accreted onto the edge. In this case, it could be North America. That's how, that's how California was built. And here's another one coming in later, from Western Nevada out to California. Here's a third one. So we have one, two, they all got stuck onto the edge here, I guess just two of them. And that is uh, called accretion. And that's how continents grow laterally sideways and get larger and larger. North America didn't used to be as big as it is today. So here's also a map of um, what we call these long, thin structures. They call, geologists call them belts because they're like a belt. They're long and thin, like a belt goes around your waist. This darker one is actually serpentine or serpentinite, the state rock of California. The red hills here is made of serpentine. It's this greenish rock, and really wonderful looking stuff. You don't want to build a house on it because it's weak and it landslides, it's horrible stuff. Engineers hate it, Caltrans hate it. It's like, go out to Humboldt County, there's serpentine failing and all the roads are coming apart up there. Um, oops, so these belts of long, thin, uh, island art complexes over here. This is just a side view, but it's a string of islands that get squished and stuck and make a belt of similar type of rocks, causing the continent to grow outward by the thickness of that belt. We have belt after belt after belt. Let's take a look. All right. Here's a, another view of subduction right here with accretion. This is called an accretionary wedge. You can see how it's wedge shaped, that kind of a triangular, and all these rocks are just getting mashed right into that trench, into that subduction zone. And that's kind of why it's hard to identify some of these rocks. They're all mashed up, and they just really squished. And what is this, Jeff? Leave her right. 
Leave it right, yeah, right there. Get it out of here. <laughs> but these subduction and accretion uh, processes are what have built the Sierra Nevada, basically. And so this uh, diagram comes from uh, Ted Konigsberg, who wrote Geologic Trips in the Sierra Nevada. If you like to get in your car and go to places, he's got some on the east side, some on the west side. You can go and drive up to and, and see some of the geologic evidence he used to piece, a, piece this story together. 360 million years ago, MYA, this is what the western margin of North America looked like. The blue is water. There was ocean water coming all the way up to a path where we are today, went into Nevada, right? These island art complexes had not come in yet. So the edge of the continent, you got to go over where Sora Pass is today, wasn't there in fact 360 million years ago, and find the edge before Pangaea even was formed. Now, if we go to 150 million years ago, uh, several of these island art packages have come in. We call these terrains, not like a choo-choo terrain, but a T-E-R-R-A-N-E. -E. Down here, we have the Foothills terrain, number four, Don Pedro terrain, number three, Calaveras complex, number two, and Shoe Fly complex, number one. Shoe Fly is older. Uh, Calaveras then comes in after the Shoe Fly. Here's the Shoe Fly up here. So that dock first. I'm saying dock like a ship docking on uh, at a dock. <laughs> Calaveras complex, um, then the Don Pedro terrain, then the Foothills terrain. Um, at Samar years and years ago, when my, one of my kids was like four years old, we were in the line with the chat, I was talking to the checker, and you can buy those little uh, phone cards, you know, and, um, and so my uh, my son had a bunch, he was getting them off while I was talking to the checker, we were distracted puts them on the conveyor belt, and all these little credit cards start going in, the, the checker notice, like, oh, no, stop, how do I stop, you know? And I was looking at it going, oh, that's kind of like a cushion, I love it. <laughs> that credit card went in first, this one came in, jacked in, and then this one went behind it. And I was just getting a kick out of it, but the checker wasn't all that happy, you know, so we made it out alive. But that's how this Western margin of North America has built up geologically. So I made a geologic map, and that's what this is. I don't have a key in here, but on the bottom, I do have a, sort of a little legend. Metamorphic is green rocks that are about 200 million years old. So that's this, these belts of similar rocks. They're not exactly the same, but this is the metamorphic zone in here. Meta means change, morph means form. Three rock types, igneous, ignition in your car, fire, pop, melted, volcanoes, right? Um, and then sedimentary, rocks that get laid down in flat horizontal layers, mostly, and then metamorphic rocks that get squished or contorted, igneous or metamorphic or sedimentary, they get misshapen. So they change their form. Meta means change, morph means form. And so the green ones that change their form, those are the, uh, the little credit cards on my little model, you know, the, the uh, accretionary wedge. And then we have the, uh, about a hundred million year old granitic rock. This, this is supposed to be pink. This is called the standard Pluton. Pluto, the god of the underworld, how does granitic rock form? Kind of like lava lamp bubbles. When you watch a lava lamp and get all mesmerized, each one of those bubbles is called a Pluton to a geologist. Um, they make an individual structure several miles across or more. And then they sit there under, underground, cooling the magma molten rock, igneous, Cools slowly like rock candy. If you've ever seen rock candy form, it takes weeks, if not longer, for the crystals to get bigger and bigger and fill in all the spaces. That's granitic rock. And the, most of the eastern Sierra is underlain by pink granitic rock. It has this purple stuff on top of it right here, th these little streaks that kind of come down. And those are only 10 million years old. The granitic rock is about 100 million, so 90 million years goes by. And volcanoes wake up and start covering the granite with ash flows and lava flows like Table Mountain. And what's going on with that? The east side of the Sierra wakes up and magma starts coming down and covering the landscape. The older granitic rocks with the younger volcanic rocks. I call it the uh, older granitic cake with the younger volcanic frosting covering it, right? And the kids have got their fingers in the frosting here on the pattern. And then finally, this yellow stuff out here, this is 
the remnants, like when you drive to Knights Ferry and then you see Lever's Leap where that flag is on your way to Oakdale, please don't go. Okay. <laughs> we want you to see more birds. You're standing on stacks of sediments from those old volcanoes that are no longer at Sonora Pass anymore. Well, some remnants are there, but a lot of that stuff eroded from uh, overlying the granitic rocks because the granite didn't make it to the surface. Some of it did. Some of that magma came out and formed a chain of volcanoes like the Cascades, like the whole Cascade Range from Lassen all the way to Canada, the Whistler. So where's all those volcanoes? They're eroded and now they're underneath Oakdale and Nice Ferry. Those layers that you drive down, what's that layer? I don't know, someday I'll find out when I go to a bird talk. I'm gonna zoom in a little bit. Here is, uh, this is the Red Hills right here, this kind of uh, little oblong uh, piece of rock. Copperopolis, Angels Camp, Columbia, Sonora, Jamestown. So these green rocks again are the metamorphic rocks. This little strip right here, if you can see that, is Table Mountain. This is a lava flow, and it actually looks kind of like a riverbed with some sinuous uh, meanders in it. Like, what? Well, that's kind of crazy. This came from the other side of Sonora Pass. There was an active volcanic system over there from about 14 to 6 million years, roughly about 10 million years ago. Up and up all these lava flows, 38 of them have been mapped. One of them came all the way to Knights Ferry. 80 miles. That's one. This is one of the longest lava flows on planet Earth. It's crazy to think about, right here in Palm County. And so, in the solar system, okay, think about that one tonight. So, uh, then you've got this big blob of granite where Standard is and Sonora, right on the edge. You know, when you drive, um, let's see, what's it called? Barrows now, uh, the restaurant with the veterinary uh, and that shopping center and you're you just let's say you're going towards downtown old town sonora that little hill that they recently uh treated vegetation management yeah boom right there is the contact between the granite and all these old sediments that turned into metamorphic rock so you just sit right there and then just drove, drive right down towards uh cost you less or whatever it's called you know um and then in downtown sonora you're in 300 to 400 million year old rocks. You just left some 100 million year old granitic rocks, right? And you don't even know. <laughs> I do. That's the weird Jeep that's slowing down every time. <laughs> yeah. So this pattern, it goes up and down the central Sierra and uh, with granitic rocks on the eastern two thirds of the county and uh, metamorphic rocks on the western third. So that's the overarching pattern. How does all this? geology tie into birds, right? So we just learned the answer is accretion, subduction and accretion, right? And, and some, some uh, subduction makes volcanoes, magma that turns into granite rocks, volcanoes on top, that, that shuts down sometimes and erodes away. That's a whole other story, but you still have those accreted terrains up and down with granite behind it. And then um, in, the, in talking with the bear, let's talk habitats and let's talk resources and where do birds live, what do they eat, what do they need? How does that relate to the underlying geology? Down here, I put um, things like tectonic activity, volcanoes, earthquakes, landslides, tsunamis, erosion, sedimentation. These all shape the Earth's surface. And I've got some pictures coming up and create habitats for birds. And some species, um, like mountains, some like waterways, right? So let's take a little look. And here's our state of California and all the variety that we have. We have mountains, rivers, coastlines, flat valleys and plains. We have it all. California is just amazing, right? And partly because we have three plate tectonic plate boundaries. We got the Salton Sea rifting apart, San Andreas transform, and then we get to Cape Mendocino convergence. That's why Lassen, P, and Mount Shasta are there. Those are volcanoes formed by subduction offshore of Humboldt County all the way to southern Canada. Now, the uh, story down here is not one of subduction anymore. That stopped. No more subduction, no more accretion going on the whole length of the San Andreas Fault. The two plates are simply sliding past each other, but it gets more complex. And this diagram is going to come up a little later because it, it figures prominently in uh, habitats and climate and weather. This is the east side right here. Eastern Sierra has a uh, frontal fault system. It's not 
continuous and long like the San Andreas, but it covers about that much area. It's a whole bunch of little sections of fault that slip and that they can produce major earthquakes, like in 1872, about a magnitude 7.8 or 7.9. John Muir wrote about this. Rock falls all night long coming down in Yosemite Valley. He was, woo -hoo -hoo, but he was like, moving along. Lucky he didn't die, in my opinion. And if that happens again today, we have 4 million people coming to Yosemite every year, mostly in the summertime. And those rock falls are just going to be intense, you know. But uh, Greg Stock, the park geologist, has mapped all the rock falls and how far they go out and how high the water goes when the river floods. And they've actually overlapped each other in some places in Yosemite Valley. And they've taken buildings out based on the geological knowledge that he and his colleagues have actually been working with. So that's pretty cool. Now, on the east side, the Sierra Nevada is jacking up like a giant trapdoor towards Hopeton. Any in, any in. <laughs> so the door is popping open, right? And basically, the hinge line would be down here. Or, well, here's, here's Central Valley. Oakdale's like right down here. Here's our ri a typical river system like the Stanislaw or the, the McCallany or the Tuolumne. And so you got the Central Valley filling with all these sediments eroding off of the Sierra Peaks. The east side, however, is jacking up higher and higher. The reason that the Table Mountain lava flow could make it all the way to Knights Ferry, Sonora Pass wasn't as high as it is today. This is still jacking up today. So it was thousands of feet lower, and that volcanic system was able to disgorge its lava all the way down the old Paleo Stanislaw River now. So, uh, quick question. The volcanic system east of um, Sonora Pass. So was it for like one volcano or 20 volcanoes or? One, uh, typically we think it was one super volcano that caused those uh, 38 or so flows, including Table Mountain, uh, the Little Walker Caldera. The caldera, by definition, is a volcanic depression larger than a mile across. Otherwise, it's a crater. Craters are smaller, calderas are massive. Yellowstone being the prime example, 40 miles across. Long Valley Caldera, where Mammoth is, that's about 20 miles long and 12 miles wide. That's a super volcano that's still got activity. There's a magma chamber a mile down. It's got hot springs all over. So that's got all kinds of volcanic deposits all around it. So it's something similar to Long Valley Caldera extinct today. Although there are hot springs. Ross and I have been in Bales Hot Springs, which is right in the center of that caldera. So it's mostly considered uh, dormant or dead right now. However, that's on this fault system right here. This is not just one side moving up and the other down, the Sierra Nevada popping up, the Great Basin down. It's also got some uh, pull apart motion. It's called transtensional is the technical term, transform sideways tensional pulling apart. It's got both of those. So there are places where the crust pulls apart, pressure is reduced, magma can come out and reach the surface over geologic time. So it doesn't happen every year, but over, you know, the last big one in Long Valley, 760,000 years ago, three quarters of a million years ago, popped off four inches to six inches of ash in Kansas was deposited. And if you drive from uh, Crowley Lake down to Bishop, that's called the volcanic tablelands, and you're going from like 8,000 feet down to 4,000, you got several thousands of feet of volcanic ash that you're driving there. So Ross's son drives that every day to, <laughs> to work. He lives right on the edge of his family. So uh, let's go to Table Mountain, some pictures. Woo! So I flew a drone over Table Mountain. That's this panorama. What was this, about two days ago, I think? And so uh, water level is pretty good, right? This is the Maloney's, right? And Ginger and Barry and I came all with the boat all the way around here, 52 miles. And here's Table Mountain, just because of the drones perspective, it looks a little warped, but it's flat, trust me. <laughs> that didn't happen in the last week. And so um, I also captured a photo of part of the cliff. This is a completely different rock type than this stuff right down here. Here at the table, this, uh, this feature would be just to the left off of the photograph right here. So an ecotone is a place where two ecosystems come together. And Table Mountain's got a really, it's like a desert ecology on top of Table Mountain. There's nothing that grows up there, except there is stuff that grows up there, right? Little gophers that burrow in, it's kind of an interesting place, but it's not a real super 
you know, like a tropical rainforest type of system. But they're two different systems. You got places to nest, you got different animals up on top, gophers maybe, there's probably gophers down below, but hey, birds would take advantage of this kind of stuff because of the geology, right? And um, help me out with this, this bird right here is in this picture. And I zoomed in and I snipped that and that. I zoomed, this is about before it gets too pixelated. Can you see anyone tell, anyone know birds in this crowd? I don't. I'm kind of swift. I, I call it a speckled winged bat monger, but that's just a guess. <laughs> All right, mystery bird over here. You guys can look at this afterwards. So, uh, <laughs> Part three, um, geology, and uh, let me see, I can't even see my title here. So we're still on, we're on birds, and we're on resources, and birds often, um, oh, migration, right. So this image I stuck on here from Google Earth, Monterey Bay down here on the lower left, San Jose, Sacramento, Mono Lake, Tahoe, and we are right about in here. And so um, I thought, you know, migration, birds, the Pacific flyway, right? Birds have to fly and land and refuel, recharge their batteries, that kind of stuff. So how do you do that? Well, you can follow the San Andreas Fault, which you can see from space. It's also got these features called sag ponds. And a sag pond is a feature where the crust sags down right along the fault. The fault's winding these plates uh, together and, you know, the ground, uh, there's no place for the water to drain except right along the fault in these sacks. And the ponds fill, the water fills up and makes ponds. What I wanted to do here, let me, you know what? Let me just look at our time. Yeah. Um, the, suffice it to say there's sack ponds. I was going to go off and pull Google Maps up, but I think what I'll do is focus on these water features right along here. What are these? See these blue, these dark features on the map? We got them all up and down the mother lake. Here's the high Sierra. This is the forested, you know, 5,000, 6,000 foot elevation or four to seven. And then we got the foothills down right down here, the foothills. Any guesses? These features, this one, that one, that one, that one, that one. Lots of reservoirs, yeah. So each one of these is a, a man-made feature. So a river comes down like this one. This would be the Stanislaw River. Here's Columbia, here's Sonora, and here's Angel's Camp. So New Balloonies, right? The, the dam is right here. But before the dam, the river came down here, made a little bend, came over here. And then for Don Pedro, here's Groveland. So Pine Mountain Lake on the other side is the Tuolumne River, comes down. Look at this little jog. I don't know if you can see that very well, but there's a jog here. Another jog, like a 90 degree jog, and then it comes out. Then it's got two, Don Peter has these two really big arms. And guess what? Maloney's has these two arms. They're both going north, south, east, west, right? When I first got here, I didn't know this. And I thought, what's up with that? Well, guess what? Reservoirs follow faults in red. Not all reservoirs, because these are, this is uh, Eleanor, this is Cherry Lake, and this is Hetch Hetchy. I drew blue lines on top of these lakes to show the direction that the little glaciers coming down the valleys would have probably taken. So some res reservoirs get the, the reservoir, the dam, river's dam, the reservoir backs up into a glacial valley. However, in the foothills here, all the dams impound the water and then some of it fills these side canyons or side valleys. Up. And those are following the Maloney's Fault, mostly the Maloney's Fault system. The dams literally for New Maloney's Reservoir is literally on top of the new Louis Fall. <laughs> Nervous chuckles break out. <laughs> uh, How long is that fall? Um, runs from about uh, Mariposa to north of Grass Valley. So it's a major, major start. This was a tectonic plate back. And that's the Maloney's Fault system. There's also the Vera Mountains Fault system, the Sonoran Fault. In between these terrain, or on the edges of these terrains, by definition, these long belt-like geologic structures that we're calling terrains, these are bounded by faults on their sides. Major fault structures in the, in the foothills of the Sierra. And the Maloney's fault system, um, 
I don't know if they put it, they might have put a, a, a slide, but when the magma was coming up, when it was tectonically active and producing volcanoes, some of that heat then uh, got into the sediments from uh, offshore that came and accreted, and then remobilized microscopic gold. And then where does that hot water laden with quartz and gold go? The path of least resistance. Where's the nearest fault? Let's take a look. And so the Maloney's fault got the majority of a lot of the lower gold. So low gold is in the hard rock in quartz. You gotta hammer it out or blast it. Um, the easy pickings, Mother Nature broke up a lot of these quartz veins, just earthquakes and mud flows, debris flows. And then the gold was, was uh, released from the quartz and formed nuggets. And then the first miners, easy pickings, they would just come, you know, it, it was literally just the stuff was laying on the ground or in the stream beds in Columbia. The old Paleo Stanislaw River, we think, flowed over the Columbia Basin. Geologists call it the Columbia Basin, where Old Town is. And then it cut a new pathway after Table Mountain came down 10 million years ago. That new pathway is now 900 feet below where it used to flow over Old Town Columbia. And so it flowed over a bunch of marble. And the marble is, you know, doesn't form up like nice flat smooth surfaces. It cracks and dissolves and all kinds of crap. Those were natural ripples that trapped these gold nuggets, high and dry. So then they had to bring water in through water companies. And, you know, you see all the old pictures of flumes and people solutioning or going to uh, uh, where the trout farm is over by, um, oh, what's the? Oh, Springfield. Springfield, yeah, Springfield. So they've spring there, and that was the closest water. But, or gold springs. They'd have to take it out there in wheelbarrows, and that was one of the ways they processed the gold. So um, the uh, review of this, because uh, this diagram is going to uh, tie in with climate and with weather, rain shadow effects, for example, a rain shadow when the air, the predominant air masses, these are like giant pan invisible pancakes of air, a couple miles tall and thousand miles or more wide that travel across the Pacific Ocean and they pick up moisture. When it hits the coast range, it gets big surf, that air lifts and it rains like mad over there sometimes. Then it comes over the, center, the uh, coast range into the Central Valley, it compresses, it warms up, rain shadow over past Los Angeles. Don't get much rain over there. Then it hits Samoa and starts rising. By the time it gets to Ross's cabin at Eagle Meadows, it's dumping 80 inches of rain a year. 80 inches, is that a fair estimate? Or 80, 80 inches of precipitation in the form of snow in the winter with rain in the summer. And so, why is that? Because of this trap door effect, we have the, the east side that's being lifted up, air masses come across, air rises, it cools, it condenses, precipitates, and then as soon as it goes over, it's a little drier, lost some moisture, it also compresses, and then basically we call it the rain shadow effect. Totally different uh, weather and climate and birds over there have to deal with a desert. Rains less than 10 inches of rain once you get over across to, to the basin and rains. Now, this is a place uh, up the pass, up towards uh, Kennedy Meadows, right past Gardnell's, Columns of the Giants. And these columns formed from some kind of a lava impoundment, a lava lake that cooled. And the bottom part is called a uh, colonnade. They're really pretty big columns. And then there's a distinct change that you can see right about in here. And then this top part, the columns are much smaller and they're no longer vertical. They twist and it's like, what's going on with that? Well, if you go to Iceland, people have seen these structures over there. And either ice from glaciers, if the, if the lava erupts underneath the glacier, it'll pond and form columns at the bottom and an entablature is, is what the structure at the top is called. It's kind of these swirly sort of columns. And so um, guess what? We had fractures opening up with lava pouring out only 150,000 years ago. This is nothing. If humans are that last little nail file, 300,000, this is halfway back during our own history, right? And this was going on when humans were on Earth, Homo sapiens were on Earth. And so it's like, likely that either snow or uh, ice got down in here. Um, Ken Bruges was uh, used to Run, uh, uh, be the caretaker for the Bennett Juniper. Maybe some of you knew him. 
he wrote a paper, just published his own paper, paper about the ice thickness here, and it's about 3,000 feet thick because there's what we call glacial erratic boulders 3,000 feet above Eureka Valley up for Dardanelles. So you've got to go all the way up 3,000 feet. There's like glacial erratic boulders that were deposited by glaciers that point, 2,800 feet or something like that. And uh, yeah, great discovery. He came on some of the Ross and my uh, field trips as well. Self taught geographer, but he taught himself some geology. So this is a topo map. And if you look carefully, these little lumps right in here are columns of the giants. So the Dardanelles would be here, Kennedy Meadows up in here, uh, Baker Station, the outdoor education uh, facility for the college is right in here. And right, there's all these red lines that are linear geologic features that I think, one of my working hypotheses, is that these are faults that open up from time to time. And we found some cracks with lava hardened in the fault at the surface that you can walk up to and check out. And it's the same stuff as all of the giants just downstream. And my students and I mapped these for multiple summers in a row. And we have convinced ourselves that that's the story here. And this fault system parallels the eastern, the, uh, the fault on the east side, the Sierra Nevada funnel fault system. So guess what I think maybe what is happening See these fractures right here, or this big one right here? This side's going down, this up. I think another one is forming right up here by Kennedy Meadows. Here's Snorro Pass, go down to 6,000 feet. Got another crack system. This big trap door can't take it anymore. It's going to snap and break. And I hope some really cool hot springs for me because I don't want to drive so far, you know? <laughs> Wouldn't that be cool? So there's a working hypothesis. That's what geologists do. We have multiple working hypotheses. And so we put them out there, people test them, and that's why we retire. So we don't do that kind of stuff. Um, a map of the marble. I talked about the marble. Most of the caves and caverns in the Sierra are related to this uh, Columbia, sorry, the Calaveras complex marble in blue. There's some right in Columbia. This, uh, I put something called an earth cache. It's like a geological geocache. It focuses on geology, if you like that kind of thing. But guess what? There's a little strip up here in Anador County. This green is Calaveras County right here. So we've got um, uh, Black Chasm up here, California Chasm, somewhere in Cal California Caverns, and then we've got Mercer and Moaning, and then we even have a down here, Bower Cave is down here outside of Yosemite. Here's Tuolumne County right here, and then Yosemite would be out here. Here's a Hetch Hetchy, for example. So there's these, this belt of marble actually goes up and down the mother. And the, and the marble is a limestone reef type complex on the fringes of some of these volcanic island arms. Isn't that crazy to think about it? Hawaii, you go there, many people go to die because of the coral reefs, right? So some of these reef structures got smeared and accreted onto the edge of North America. Now people come and travel and see the caves and caverns. And some birds, I don't know, I just threw this bird in there, killed here. It'll basically nest on rocks, right? And the eggs change the color of the surroundings. And so I don't know, you know better than I if birds are nesting on the marble or these kinds of features, but why not? Another unique feature is this sort of reddish, pinkish, purplish uh, feature. This is the Red Hills. It's about 8, 000, seven or 8,000 acres of serpent, serpentinite, the state rock of California. Well, how did this get here? There's the Bear Mountains Fault that is behind uh, Angel's Camp. Those are the Bear Mountains. Fault comes down on one side. It actually bifurcates or splits up here, and it surrounds the Red Hills. And it joins back into one strand down here. And what we think happened is serpentine minerals. It's a group of half a dozen or more minerals. They're iron, magnesium, silicates. And um, on the fringes is a rock that you can find in places called peridotite. And there's another one called dunite. And these are formed at the top of the Earth's mantle. How that stuff get all the way up to the surface? Like, really intriguing. What we think is hot water in the subduction process went down, altered a piece or a big you know, blob of this peridotite, 
and it changed its density into because the, the all of the minerals that's really uh, the, the, the iron silicate that's much more dense became serpentinized, and then sort of like a marshmallow fluffy nut, the density changed, turned into a hot air balloon. Where's the path of least resistance? Oh, the bare mountains fall. Let's go that way, and it, we call that process protrusion, and it protruded all the way up to the surface, and here it sits. Um, the plants generally don't like magnesium. It's a, a an atom that's about the same size as calcium. It's got the same electrical charge, plus two, so it can substitute into crystalline structures for calcium and make bones weaker, pre presumably. And so animals and plants that eat, uh, that grow on high magnesium serpentine soils um, have an effect. And so some plants can tolerate it, like a grapevine. Um, Brush loves it out there if you hike the red hills. The oaks, you will nearly find an oak tree on the red hills, right? Here's a picture of the dividing line. These are, uh, this is buckbrush, and there's some manzanita in here probably. They can tolerate. These are gray pines. These are oak trees all through here. So you can't see them that well because they haven't leafed out yet. This was a couple days ago when uh, Ginger and I were out there. But right here, so, see that dividing line? Ecotone, right, Barry? Yeah. All right, so right there. So what kind of species are here that don't like it over here? Oaks, obviously, but what birds like acorns that don't want to, you know, what birds take advantage of gray pine cones versus don't like, or maybe they like both, and they're, they're happily living right on that dividing line. So that would be a place I would go to look for a, a variety of species instead of the middle of the Red Hills or the middle of, you know, the, out here in the Don Pedro tree. So there's a, an example of an ecotone, I think. I'm, I'm not an expert on that, but I throw that out to some of you that would be more expert than I. Another um, geologic catastrophes and disasters. We have local examples here. This is the Sword Lake debris flow, which is up Highway 108, um, off of Clark Fork Road. Before the Dardanelles, you take a left and then you go out to Fence Creek. And you can hike up to the Darn Mountains. They're absolutely beautiful. There's probably all kinds of interesting birds up in that area as well. Well, um, in 1997, that was an El Nino year, and there was a rain on top of a snow event, rain on snow event, with about 18 inches of rain recorded at the Gianelli gauge up in the Stanislaw nearby here. 18 inches on top of five or six feet of snow. That within just a, a few days, that rain that whole week. Some of you probably remember that. And so this is a student of mine right here. See that person? This is a boulder that came down from this amazing uh, debris flow. And a debris flow, it's like a landslide, but it's got trees and rocks and sand and mud all mixed together. It's like slur it's like concrete, like a concrete slurry with everything that it can take out in front of it, you know, old growth trees, that kind of stuff. And so what does that do? It disturbs the landscape and the Birds like that kill deer that like bare spaces can probably come in. There's some new habitat, and, but it's obviously going to flush the other stuff out before. But then these dividing lines and these boundaries are where all this interesting, intense activity can then start happening. And so um, th I threw a couple other ideas out here that we're getting towards the, the end of the story here. Earthquake effects. What would happen if we had another magnitude eight, like John Muir wrote about in 1872? What would that do to all the nesting birds in these cliffs in Yosemite and the rock falls, the subsequent rock falls? How about in the talus slopes and the forest below? So not a, not a pleasant thing to think about, you know, but it will rearrange some, some ecology. Um, and then volcanic events, the closest volcano to us is 70 miles away. 70 miles? Wow. That's, that's, yeah. We should know that. <laughs> it's in the, the middle of Mono Lake. There's Neged Island and Peoa, and one of them is an active volcano. Both of them were formed by uh, magma coming up under the lake. One of them is black and one of them is white. The black is the lava made it to the surface. It made Neged Island, Neged or Neged. The other one has white rock, and that pushed the lake sediments up to the surface, but the lava didn't poke out and turn black. But that's uh, Peoa. And that's seven, you get on Google, 70 miles from here. That's like, ooh. Thank you. <laughs> uh, tsunami, tsunami, I don't live on the beach. Well, there's a tsunami that uh, happened in Lake Tahoe. 
If you look at a map of Lake Tahoe, it's like a big shark bite out of the western side of Lake Tahoe. An underwater landslide went down. Lake Tahoe's about 1,600 feet deep, I think. It went into the bottom and boom, the waves went out. They call it a seiche, S-E-I-C-H-E, when the waves go back and forth, like lifting a bathtub up and dropping it. Ooh, the water goes back and sloshes. That's a seiche, but they're all tsunamis. It's multiple tsunamis, lots of them, for hours, okay? And I haven't been to Tahoe in a little bit, but on Lakeshore Boulevard in Incline Village, there were two houses for sale on beachfront property, lakefront property. Guess how much? This was 10 years ago. Only 60 million each. 10 years ago, 60 million. I don't know what they're doing. Anyone here? Raise your hand who has 60 million. Should we all chip in? <laughs> Let's get tsunami insurance. Oops, one more uh, down here. Debris flow. I talked a little bit about debris flow. That's the, the uh, sourgrass one, but we've had others. Um, or this was the Sword Lake one. Sourgrass at Highway 4. Uh, Disaster Peak has had multiple since I've been in the, in the area here. So we're going to continue to get more. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And if you ever see brown muddy water, that's what's going on up there. That has repeated debris flows up there. And it's most likely because the glaciers, when they've retreated, they leave these sandy deposits behind called moraines. And when those things get saturated, it's like too much water in a sand castle. Everything just goes down, you know? So uh, when you get these thunderstorms just over one particular spot, if there's a moraine there, then get out from below, you know. So yeah, Ralph. Do we know where that big fault was that we, we had a real powerful earthquake here about two years ago, right in Sonora. Mm -hmm. Grinding the mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the most of the seismicity, uh the, the faults that go right through town, the the Sonora fault goes through lower right below lower Saymar. I mean, but it's been extinct or hasn't had any motion on it for, you know, 10,000 years or something. Um, the, we feel, uh, you know, uh, the east side, and we also feel the fault system that comes down through Markleyville from Tahoe. That's that same system, but it's a separate little strand. Um, but I'm trying to think. I know the one you're talking about. And there was there was uh, an initial USGS dot on the map that they corrected and was wrong. I said it was like down by Lodi or something. I can't remember that. But we haven't had anything right in Sonora, but we do tend to feel quakes from uh, the Nevada side or the east side. Uh, we'll feel when people felt the 89 quake up here that I talked to. Um, I don't know if any of you guys did, but I was uh, down in 20 miles away. <laughs> I felt it. The other question so, yeah. I had is the salt come from yeah uh the the when it when there's two types of uh weathering mechanical and chemical basically physical or, or chemical and depending on the rainwater um acidity the ph that actually the rainwater is slightly acidic when we breathe out carbon dioxide or plants decay there's carbonic acid that actually dissolves certain minerals, and then those ions go into every stream. It's, it's not pure water, it's not deionized water. So those ions accumulate in the ocean over geologic time. It gets saltier uh, and saltier. Some of it crystallizes out, and then, you know, so it doesn't build up totally. But places like the Great Salt Lake, that's just an internal basin, and that's where all that salt's coming from is the Wasatch Mountains and the other mountains around there when it does dissolve chemically. So, yeah. Let me uh, get to the end. I'll take questions. This was the last part of the story. Um, these are called, you can't see the title very well, but it says uh, the five big ones, five big what? The five big mass extinctions on Earth. And so uh, there are uh, on our hand, right? These all happen since your wrist. Here's the beginning of Earth, all the way to the end. And all five of them are roughly a hundred million years apart. So you could kind of divide your hand into five equal parts. And we're getting to the next one, the sixth one, right? If you think about it. So <laughs> some people argue we're in it. We're like species are disappearing as fast as they've ever disappeared. 
The bottom line is, if this is on uh, Zoom, you can go back and read the details, but the bottom line in my mind is that all five of them connect to our atmosphere through either carbon dioxide or heating or cooling of our atmosphere. And the, the, the one way I think of it is if I took a basketball and I took a can of paint, I just painted one layer of paint on the basketball. The earth simulates the basketball, the layer of paint, that thickness of one layer of paint, relative to the size of our planet, that's how thick or thin, I should say, of our atmosphere is. We just take it for granted that it comes up forever or it goes up till as airplanes fly or whatever. But that's really all that we have. It, all, everything that, every wildfire that, now we got purple air and we have air quality sensors and stuff, we're filling up our atmosphere with carbon dioxide and all kinds of other particulate matter and stuff that we probably should think about because every one of these extinctions relates to something going on with our atmosphere. And in summary, <laughs> Um, so the Earth, based on our timeline, thank you for doing that, uh, is about 4.6 4 billion years old, and birds popped up that last little knuckle here, practically. That's about it. And, and bird watchers, <laughs> the last little uh, uh, shaving of fingernail right there, the tip of your fingernail. And uh, the answer was subduction and, and uh, accretion. What was the question? What's the geology of Central Sierra? How did that form? If you can wrap your head around subduction and accretion, you pretty much have a good idea. Uh, then the connection between geology and birds, all those big habitat formations, migration routes, following all those reservoirs or sap ponds, um, climate influence, the nesting sites like on Table Mountain or say maybe Calms of the Giants, uh, those might be uh, interesting places to explore. The fossil Archaeopteryx, and then as far as resources or ecotones, I didn't get too much because I'm not an expert on that. But you know, look at just pay attention to where the trees are and aren't around the redwoods, for example. You know, and then um, we can also have geological events like uh, earthquakes and volcanic eruptions. Uh, the one of the best bird fossil sites in the world right now is in China, and it's there because the volcano erupted and the ash. Um, basically smothered birds that ended up at the bottom of a lake and they're in this muddy, ashy layer preserved with their feathers and everything. They, but they were killed. <laughs> so geology can make a, a, you know, an impact. And then that last slide, the five big ones, extinction is going to continue to happen. So I'll say um, thank you 